This video is all about helping you pass the Hawaii real estate exam. I've taken this exam six times. So just know whatever I am mentioning on this video is because I think it is important for passing the exam. I am using this book, Principles and Practices of Hawaiian Real Estate. If you haven't signed up for a course yet, that is the first step before taking the exam and I have the course that I recommend linked below. I am not giving real estate advice. This is purely for studying purposes. Starting in 1848, that is when the Great Mahele happened. It's also called the Great Division of Lands. And that is when King Kamehameha decided to divide our land and hold title to our land and how they do in the rest of the United States and basically how we do it today. Before that, the 1848 is when the kings and queens pretty much owned all the land, like how it's happened in many other countries where the, you know, the kings own the land and then the commoners don't really you know own much so that is called the feudal system so that was before the great mahele hawaii participated in the feudal system now today with the system that we use it is called the aloido system pretty much what happened after 1848 was that king kamehameha kept one fourth of the land which is called crown lands so there's three fourths of the land left half of that was in the hands of the government and then the other half the are called konohiki lands which the ali'i own which are like you know the the king's chiefs and such so what happened was that after that the commoners the kanaka really didn't have any land say and they were the ones that were farming and occupying most of the land in hawaii what happened was the land commission which is a group that kamehameha appointed to to deal with all this land stuff the land commission decided whoever is occupying and working the land can make claims to the land by applying for titles with the land commission so whoever did that you know had rights to own the land and that was how kuleana lands came about a little while after that in 1893 the hawaiian monarchy got overthrown and the crown land which were owned by the king got confiscated and sold so that's what i think you need to know about hawaiian history the state now has all of our land categorized in four different categories which is urban agriculture rural and conservation so urban accounts for 4.7 percent of the land agriculture takes about 47 percent of the land rural is 0.2 percent and the remaining 48% is conservation land. Okay, now I'm gonna go on to land use. I'm kind of just following the order of this book that I have. So the state has 90% to all oil, mineral, and gas rights, but it's not like our land has many of those type of rights and whatever the state does not own it's owned by the private owner whoever owns the land and then something else that's really important is that how the state defines how much land on the beach they own is up to the high wash of the waves is what the state determines that they own so basically if you are on the beach and you are within the mark of the high wash of the waves you are on state land and you're not trespassing on anyone's property and then when it comes to lava on the big island whatever newly created lava that forms land is automatically owned by the state now i'm gonna go to fee simple you've probably are familiar with this term it is a freehold estate on the test do not get confused if you see a question about a freehold estate just think in your mind it's something that's fee simple try not to get too confused particular to Hawaii is called dower and curtsy and it's an automatic life estate giving to a surviving spouse of a marriage and the reason why they did this was so that couples if one of them died that the other spouse would have something that you know could still own part of the house even though it was not in let's say the wife's name it was only in the husband's name but we do not do this anymore this is a thing of the past since 1977 no one else has there has been no new downward and curtsy estates now what has taken over is called the uniform probate code 
and probate is pretty much going to court the next thing i want to talk about is land stuff so so most regular easements are recorded through title and there will be something on the title saying like oh there's an easement here so many feet blah 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 for this owner to use but a prescription easement is there is no written record of it and it's been continuously used for a period of time for at least 20 years like i said no recordation of it no permission and it's being used open and freely like they're not hiding that they are using this driveway or using this area that's not theirs so that is called a prescription easement it's similar to adverse possession but it's not the same and then the state holds the right of eminent domain which pretty much is when the land is needed for public use so the land may be acquired through a process called condemnation the two people that they can that the state can take eminent domain for is for public bodies and then number two is for public corporations like utility companies roadways or schools so okay i'm not sure but like an example of this could be like the state had to claim eminent domain in some parts on oahu to build the rail that could be an example of eminent domain and then now i'm going to talk about encroachments so something that you will have to know is the de minimis which i think it means like minus or something but to this was created to help solve problems of encroachments in hawaii because a while back before 1997 the tools that they used prior to 1997 were not as accurate as they are today there has been some slightly incorrect marking of boundaries in the past so this is the de minimis is pretty much it, it allows people to have it allows properties to have some leeway and they are not considered encroachments so commercial land is three inches that you can have a, a discrepancy in residential land is six inches that someone can have a discrepancy in agricultural and rural land is nine inches and then conservation land is 18 inches that there can be a discrepancy meaning if i had a i had a fence built in 1990 let's just say i had a concrete fence built in 1990 and it is three inches into my neighbor's yard i have you know rights to keep that there because of de minimis i have a total of six inches of leeway and that is only of course if my fence was built and put up there before 1997 anything after that 1997 like if somebody just built a fence two years ago and it's encroaching by three inches that's not right it is considered an encroachment and this de minimis would not apply now i'm gonna go on to title and you really need to know about this this is one of those practical things that you actually need to know about when you become a realtor so there are four different ways that people can hold title in the state of hawaii so when somebody buys a house they need to decide how they will hold title and it pretty much goes over what happens if somebody dies what happens to the property the first way that somebody can hold title is called tenants in severity and this only applies if one person is owner one person is buying the property right it's confusing because it sounds like several but really the term is meant to sever like sever like cut off i guess so one person so tenants in severity one owner and then the second way is tenants in common tenants in common are with two or more people and the major differences with this one is that if one of the tenants or the people die then their ownership will go to their next of kin so they do have equal rights to use the property but they can have different ownership percentages so if you do purchase a property with tenants in common then it is possible for one owner to have 20 percent ownership and another owner to have 80 percent and then another important thing to know is that an owner can sell or give away their portion or even mortgage out their portion but not affect the interest of the other tenant but i mean of course who's gonna you know put what mortgage company is gonna give you a loan on a property without the consent of the other owners in reality today now the next one is called joint tenant two or more persons as well except when one of them died the 
property automatically goes to the other joint tenant without probate and they also have equal entitlement so if you have four joint ten four joint tenants they all have you know equal ownership versus you know tenants in common they can have different percentages so i like that joint tenants it does not go to probate it automatically goes to the other owner versus tenants in common where if one of the owners die of course it will have to go to probate because then they'll have to figure out like who is the next of kin for this dead person so that's one of the benefits for joint tenancy you do not have to go to probate or to court and just remember joint tenants it automatically goes to the other person if they die and then there is and if anyone ever severs the joint tenancy or like tries to give away their portion then the ownership will become tenants in common it will not stay joint tenant and then the last one is tenancy by the entirety which is two married people or two persons that are reciprocal beneficiaries so that is important to know tenancy by the entirety is reciprocal beneficiary or married people and that is the same thing as joint tenants where if somebody dies it automatically goes to the other person um so reciprocal beneficiaries you might be wondering what reciprocal beneficiaries are one of the other reasons why they also made tenancy by the entirety open to reciprocal beneficiaries is that because you know in some states same sexes cannot get married so this is for them and also for other people can be reciprocal beneficiaries but each person cannot be married you know to someone else so you could do reciprocal you could have like a mom and and son be hold tenancy by the entirety but of course they cannot be married to anyone else or be reciprocal beneficiaries with anyone else so i really recommend studying those chapters um now i'm gonna go over hawaii licensing laws which is also a very important chapter for the state test so there are three different state organizations that protect consumers from us realtors the first one is the state of consumer protection the second one which i recommend studying the most is regulated industries complaints office rico and it's a statewide agency of the department of consumer and commerce oh, commerce and consumer affairs dcca rico enforces the regulatory standards of our profession by receiving investigating and prosecuting complaints written as well as anonymous against licensees so if you ever get a rico complaint that's like really bad and then the third one is the professional and vocational licensing division of the dcca highly recommend studying a lot about rico and our real estate commission consists of nine members appointed by the governor four of them must be licensed brokers three of them must be licensed salespersons or brokers and then two of them do not hold a license but are public members the governor also chooses the chairperson and they all serve without pay so thank you to whoever's on the commission four minimum must be from oahu one must be from maui one must be from the big island and then one must be from Kauai. and then i guess the other one can be from anywhere but we need at least minimum for four Oahu, one Kauai, one Maui, one Big Island. Now I'm gonna jump to who is exempt from having a real estate license. So owners are exempt from owners of brokerages are exempt from having a real estate license except if you engage in transactions. So I actually know there's a few companies. I think at one time Hawaii Life's or one of their owners did not have a real estate license which is fine because you do not need to have a real estate license to own a company but if you are engaging in transactions then you need to have a real estate license number two who does not need a real estate license is a person acting as a legal capacity as a receiver executor or guardian i think it means if you are being an executor for someone for an estate or something you do not need a real estate license and then number three so any person's acting in a legal custodian or caretaker for just one owner meaning you someone can be a property manager as long as it's just for one owner so if this one owner owns 10 properties you can without a real estate license manage 
those 10 properties legally it's possible but if you start managing those 10 properties for one owner and then take on another owner and they have one property you cannot do that because you are managing for more than one person and that would require a real estate license so you are allowed to manage for one owner no matter how many properties they own and then the fourth person who is exempt from a real estate license is a person who rents or operates a hotel and then the fifth person is any provider or agency of a homeless facility does not need a real estate license so you should know that the real estate license requirements which is to take the 60 hour course and then you have to take the exam and apply for the license and then for the broker's license the requirements are you know taking the broker's course and the exam but you also need to be a real estate agent for at least three years and your broker needs to sign off saying that you have worked those three years with 40 hours per week that is what you also need and to pass the real estate exam as a salesperson you need to pass with a 70 percent but to get your broker's exam, you need to pass with a 75%. When it comes to real estate offices, each branch office must be registered with the state or the real estate commission. Their brokers must also be you know, assigned and registered, but brokers are not required at site offices, which are considered temporary offices, real estate condo projects or real estate subdivision so this means like if they have like a site office on a new development they're doing they do not need to have a set broker registered to sit at that office and then there is something called the recovery fund which is to protect consumers from us real estate agents as well if we mess up um you know and do something fraudulent this money is reserved and goes to you know the consumer that got screwed that got you know um screwed over i guess so we pay an initial 50 dollar fee that goes into this fund when we first get our license a one-time fee and it is saved for persons who have suffered losses i should say for our for our misrepresentation or fraudulent acts they must go and get a court judgment within two years of this event or court occurring and they must notify the real estate commission in writing and it can pay out $25,000 per person as long as it does not exceed a limit of $50,000 $50, against one licensee. Most companies though do have e insurance that could also possibly kick in to help pay off. That's it for this video. If you enjoyed this, please let me know in the comments and remember to like and subscribe.